Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome back. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Guillaume Don, CEO of Africa Oil and & Power, and uh, I'm very honored uh, and delighted to welcome my distinguished panel here. Uh, thank you very much to His Excellency the Prime Minister for his uh, opening keynotes and to each and every one of you for making it out here to Equatorial Guinea for the GECF International Gas Seminar. Uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to uh, congratulate and commend uh, GECF and His Excellency the Secretary General Yuri Centurin on bringing the GECF Gas Summit to Equatorial Guinea, the first African country to host it. Uh, it's uh, a distinct honor uh, for us as Africa Oil and Power to have been involved in this event. Uh, and uh, we commend GECF and His Excellency the Secretary General for their engagement uh, on the African continent. Uh, I also want to congratulate Equatorial Guinea and His Excellency uh, the Minister on hosting uh, this event uh, and uh, we'd like to have a round of applause for Equatorial Guinea for bringing GECF to the African continent. For many of you who know Af uh, Equatorial Guinea, the country has always been a champion for the African continent and has taken a leadership role in advocating strongly for the oil and gas interests of Africa and its producing countries. Uh, we are very, very proud to welcome, in addition to the member countries uh, from the African continent, a number of non-member countries, including Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, the Gambia, Gabon, Cameroon, uh, Sao Tome Principe, South Sudan. Uh, these are uh, countries that are emerging as uh, gas expert, uh, explorers, gas and will be gas producers in the near future, uh, and uh, I have no doubt will be members of GECF in the not too distant future, and I think that's thanks a lot to the leadership of Equatorial Guinea for, for bringing them here and for engaging. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get right into it. Gas in the geopolitical context. I have next to me uh, a very large chunk of gas reserves in the world. Uh, sitting to my left, the host country, Equatorial Guinea, His Excellency Gabriel Mbaga Obiang Lima, the Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons. Excellency, I'm going to address you with the first question. Uh, you've made it a strong point as the Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons that Equatorial Guinea should be engaging internationally uh, and should be advocating for the interests of African oil and gas producers. Uh, as the host of this event, the first African country to host this event, can you speak about the significance of this and what it says for the African continent and the future of gas in Africa? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, with the venue of His Excellency the Prime Minister, uh, I want to first of all start a very simple phrase. Gas is good for Africa. Gas is a resource that for many years has been born in Africa, has been told to us that we cannot use it because it's not economical, there is not commercial value, but Equatorial Guinea has been the best example. We have been the last one in this neighborhood having oil and gas, but we were always advised that we should do something with the gas. In Equatorial Guinea, and I have to say that even though it looks like the minister is a very intelligent, I have done all these things, it was not the minister. I did find the story here, it was His Excellency the President, that he was very clear to the ministry at that time that he did not want to see a, a, a fireball in the installation in Punta Ropa. He said, you want to recover, find me a project to do it. So the first project was a gas project, that's to bring electricity to the country. The second project was the methanol plant. But even with the methanol plant, we still have more gas. So we have to look for the next plan. The next plan was LNG. So again, it was not that we wanted to do that project. It was because it was a mandate. His Excellency, the President, always thought that it was a crime to be able to waste that resources and just take the oil. So for us, it was a mission to make sure that not only Nigeria, Algeria, <laughs> Egypt, and Equatorial Guinea in the continent use the resources. And I have to say that I'm extremely happy that we have representatives of Trinidad and Tobago. We went to Trinidad and Tobago, and Trinidad and Tobago was the best example to say you can make as much money in commercial value by using oil like you use gas. And even our first LNG, it was going to Trinidad, so we have been always thankful for that. Clearly, um, the, the, the phrase that I said at the beginning is the key one. 
more African countries need to use the gas. The gas that is being traded, that you have in Qatar, that you have in Russia, going to the European market, that are going to the America, used to be to the American market, this will come to Africa. Because actually, we are actually spending more on fuels like diesel than the Europeans. So again, it was a mission for us to make sure that these resources is taken very seriously by the Africans, not only to export it. As the last thing, I want to one more time to reiterate that for us, for Little Equatorial Guinea, it's a great pleasure to be hosting everybody because there is everybody in the world who is actually watching us to know what is going to be the decision making regarding gas here. So for us, with the help of the other member of GCA, with the help of the Secretary General of GCA, we are going to make sure that the gas is used more. And we want to make sure that more African countries use it because it's value. Gas can give you more added value to your people, can give you electricity, can give you petrochemics, and can give you more resources than even oil can give. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Syed, you are here <laughs> representing the ministerial delegation of Iran, uh, but you have also a very distinctive uh, title, former Secretary General of GECF. So you've seen the history of this organization and the way that the gas discussion has evolved. Can you give us a sense of what has taken place in the last eight years and where gas is now in the global economy? Uh, Mr. Moderator, let me first uh, join you in expressing my gratitude to the government of Equatorial Guinea, President Obia, Obiang uh, Mbosogo and His Excellency Prime Minister for hosting this important uh, session of uh, GCF uh, Summit in uh, uh, Malabo. Also, I would like to express my thanks to uh, my friend, uh, Minister Gabriel uh, Lima, for uh, successful organization of this event. Uh, I would also like to <clears throat> join you in expressing my thanks to uh, uh, Secretary General uh, uh, Sintrov for, uh, uh, and his colleagues for uh, his part in organization of this uh, event. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, there is no doubt that gas uh, used to be a domestic fuel and a marginal fuel. But now it is growing to the fuel of choice globally. <clears throat> the uh, share of gas in the uh, global energy mix used to be something around 19%, 20%. Now it is 23%. And it has the uh, prospect to increase into 26 27% in the next couple of decades. <clears throat> Therefore, one would see that gas is really replacing coal and oil, because coal is now 26%, is going to be down to something around 17, 18%. And oil also, which is now dominant on 32%, is going to go down to some 25, 26%. And this uh, goes uh, mostly to gas and renewable. Therefore, gas is becoming uh, a kind of more strategic commodity at the global stage. <clears throat> this is why we see that uh, uh, the strategic importance that used to be attached to oil in the past is gradually shifting to the gas. And we see that uh, there is now a fierce competition for gas and uh, obtaining more share of global market in gas. There is a competition not only among the big producers. We see that, for example, the Shell revolution, which took place mostly in, uh, in US, has made US not only self-sufficient, but also the big producer of gas and also an exporter of gas. And now US is not only trying to export its gas to Latin America, but also to Europe and to uh, Asia and is uh, competing with the other uh, established conventional exporters of gas. I mean, uh, some of uh, our GECF members, like Qatar, for example, is losing its share in uh, Asia and is uh, forced to look for new markets in elsewhere, which they have been successful in 
making some markets in Europe, making some markets in, uh, in Latin America, and of course, uh, it's good for them. So uh, there is uh, uh, a lot on gas, which one would take it into a core strategic commodity uh, in which we see that uh, some uh, strategic considerations and political considerations are growing in this, into this. We see, for example, U.S.-China trade war is affecting the LNG uh, contracts between U.S. and China. We see that, for example, Nord Stream 2 of Russia for exporting gas to Europe is uh, uh, a challenge. Or uh, Europe diversification of uh, uh, energy resources is taking place fiercely and uh, uh, they want to uh, ex uh, diversify not only uh, in the form of gas, um, LNG and pipeline, but also other kind of renewables. Uh, but in, in gas itself also we have seen lots of uh, changes. We see that uh, the prices are completely changed. I mean, uh, in 2014, uh, the price in Asia and Japan used to be something around $20 per uh, uh, BTU, mm -hmm. and uh, we see now it is uh, down to something around 9, 10%, and the average price is something around $4, uh, $4 uh, per uh, uh, BTU. So, uh, this is, uh, uh, and, and we see that it used to be, for example, LNG was something uh, around 20%. Now LNG is more than 32% of gas. Therefore, there are a lot of tremendous changes that is taking place and is posing lots of challenges to the conventional and established gas producing countries and gas exporting countries. And how to adopt that, it is a challenge for them. Marketing is challenge, and the others are challenge. And uh, but uh, uh, the the good thing is that uh, gas is uh, uh, adaptable to the climate change agenda, and uh, is the cleanest fossil fuel and has less emission. And uh, fortunately, we have GECF as a very good platform in order to advocate gas and promote gas. And we think that with uh, uh, bringing more uh, uh, members and more uh, interest groups into the whole uh, uh, family of, of uh, gas advocates, and especially focusing on Africa. And this is very important. I guess that Africa is going to be 20% of the population of the world in just 2030. Africa is the one of the most growing uh, energy demand of the world. So. Having an Africa focus in, uh, in the gas, uh, uh, in GSCF and in, in, in gas organizations is very important. And I hope that uh, this seminar and also this summit would uh, contribute to this cause. Th thank you very much, Excellency. Um, you're just... <clears throat> In, in, uh, in addressing the, the role that GECF has in tackling two, two main issues. One is the global energy transition and the geopolitical stakes of, of gas as a cleaner burning fuel uh, to replace coal and oil. Uh, and secondly, gas now as a geopolitical strategic resource. Uh, how much does that change, those two issues, how much does that change the role of GECF and its member countries and how they must come together to tackle that, uh, especially when it comes to the very fast increase in production from countries like the U.S., which since GECF started has gone from a non-exporter to now a significant gas exporting country. I bring that question to you, sir, um, Mr. Chiki. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks for the organizers to invite uh, uh, Sonatrak because I'm representing Sonatrak today. And uh, it's my pleasure to address this uh, distinguished uh, gathering. This is the first time I'm attending the ECF. I have been working a long time with the International Gas Union. So uh, same topics are more or less, but more focused are uh, expressed here. Uh, 
bringing the GACF within uh, Africa land is something we do appreciate very much because uh, mm -hmm. this is the land of opportunity, this is the land of future, and uh, because we have so many uh, new uh, production uh, b uh, bringing on stream for the next coming years, Africa will be one of the hotspots of the uh, gas industry. Let me just speak a few words about uh, your strategy and uh, the contribution of my country. As you may know, Algeria was one of the leaders of, within the gas industry in the early 60s. Gas was, uh, let me say, a strategic option of Algeria, and we built our first LNG plan uh, in, the, in the 60s, and since that time, gas industry was, has been uh, much developed. Today, I can say that two of three of the new projects are gas projects today. So we are still developing our different discoveries. We are uh, improving the efficiencies of our plants, etc., etc. So, as I said, gas is uh, the choice for Algeria, and the gas is producing almost 98% of the electricity that is currently uh, used within, within, within the country. But uh, gas also uh, is very important from our point of view in order to uh, become and to be uh, a very reliable uh, producer for our different clients. That is why we built uh, many uh, transnational gas pipelines uh, 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 linking the southern of Europe to Algeria, and this give us a very strategic uh, position within this uh, domain of South uh, Europa and providing uh, securely the uh, agreed quantities regardless the uh, political situations uh, that are uh, existing all around the world. This is very important. So the, our clients, they do appreciate our reliability. They do appreciate uh, the consistency of our contracts, and uh, recently we were able to renew all the contracts through the gas pipelines. Speaking about geostrategy, of course, uh, there is a slight transition within the world economy, especially for the gas domain, and what we are seeing today is the increase of the share of the LNG uh, output compared with the one we used to do. In Algeria, we are uh, copying with this situation and we are putting on stream uh, a few more and more quantities uh, of LNG for uh, different clients because the LNG is offering us this such a flexibility maybe some clients for very limited uh, period of time they are looking for but the base case is we are uh, we are uh, working uh, on the renewal of our different contracts within this, uh, these uh, uh, gas pipelines. This is the current situation uh, in, uh, of gas in Algeria, and we are uh, developing not only what is currently existing as uh, conventional resources, but also we are tackling new uh, others in order to reaffirm and to, and to uh, increase our uh, po position within this gas industry and uh, working on the unconventionals. I mean, uh, difficult reservoirs, unconventional tight uh, reservoirs, etc., etc. This is our strategy for gas, and we are moving ahead in order to achieve such goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shihi. And a follow-up question, because you, you bring up the fast increase in LNG production and the role that LNG is playing in, in overall gas production. There seems to be at play a real LNG race at the top, uh, the largest LNG producers increasingly producing at a very large scale. Do you think this is good for the global gas industry or is it uh, creating some problems for some of the smallest producers that are trying to increase their market share? For yes, yes uh, the, 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 there is no we don't have to consider LNG as a risk for the gas industry, and especially for traditional players like Algeria, uh, those who are exporting through the different pipelines. Now, the situation is that uh, there are some political crises somewhere, political constraints within some, uh, some parts of the world, 
and uh, LNG is uh, a way to tackle those, uh, those areas that could, that could not be accessed directly through pipelines. So LNG <coughs> is very, let's say, very versatile. We can use it. We can send uh, a ship at uh, the other part of the, of the world. But LNG now is competing more and more with uh, gas pipelines. So, but we don't, within Sonatrach, at least we don't consider LNG as a risk for uh, our traditional... Uh, this is something we have to consider now, definitely. Uh, LNG, of course, uh, the prices are, are, are different. LNG is uh, indexed, uh, most likely, with oil prices, which, could not, which is not uh, always the case for the gas from, uh, from, from power pipelines. That's why LNG uh, is not competing as much with the traditional gas but it could be one opportunity for people uh, exporting countries like uh, Algeria, for example, in order to uh, assure a part of its uh, marketing uh, strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to welcome His Excellency Jose Alexandre Barroso, the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Mineral Resources and Petroleum for Angola. Congratulate Angola on this year becoming an observing member of GECF. Uh, Angola in the last years has made considerable efforts uh, to reform gas legislation, introduce uh, gas policies to encourage the monetization of gas. Uh, Angola LNG came online uh, within the last five years, uh, some considerable developments. Uh, can you please kind of retrace uh, the developments that have taken place in Angola's gas sector uh, and where you think it's going to be going over the next five years? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Duane. Uh, before all, I would like to thank uh, the government of the Equatorial Guinea for inviting us on behalf of uh, Mr. Diamantina Zvedo, the Minister of uh, Mines and Mineral Resources of Angola, and my own name. Uh, so to, to respond to your, to your question, uh, as my predecessor, I would like uh, to give uh, a little bit of history of the Angola uh, production. So we've been producing oil uh, for more than 70 years now. And uh, through this um, process, we have been discovering gas. So initially, all those guys were being re-injected to improve the production of the oil or uh, being burned. Uh, since uh, Six, seven years ago, we have decided then to build, to build a LNG plant in order to uh, process some of this associated guy that has been produced uh, since ever in Angola. Uh, but we didn't have the proper legislation in order to motivate uh, the companies actually to explore and produce <coughs> gas. A couple of years ago, with uh, the new government, we have decided to perform some reforms. Uh, among those, we create the proper legislation for gas, and therefore today we have the legal conditions uh, to explore and produce gas. For this purpose, we are now in process of putting together a gas consortium uh, formed by the all major uh, companies in Angola, and we do believe that this will uh, improve uh, the mix of energy in Angola by uh, uh, bringing the gas into the pipeline. So our aim is that in the uh, within few few years, in the upcoming years, that the gas will participate with, uh, with about 20, 25 percent in the Angola energy mix. Uh, if we talk about the global um, impact of the, of the gas, we are now concentrating and uh, discuss with the neighbor countries and we are planning of building pipelines in order to export natural gas, but also we are talking to the people in order to be able to also export to those neighbor countries uh, LNG. Uh, today, we, most of the LNG that we are producing, because we built, as you said, an LNG plant back uh, five, six years ago, 
and most of the LNG is actually exported to Asia and other parts of the world. Right. Uh, I, I recall when Angola LNG came into the marketplace, there were a lot of challenges for long-term contracts, a lot of consideration with, with, with spot markets. Do you think that those constraints are bigger or, or have eased since then? And you know, how do you address LNG markets in such a competitive marketplace? Uh, we believe that uh, when a new, uh, new player comes into the, into the market, it's very difficult because the, the countries and the people that buy LNG, they want security. Uh, at the beginning, it's very difficult to prove that you have uh, the capacity or the capability of uh, continuously uh, f uh, furnish those, those, uh, those products. But uh, after... Uh, few difficulties in the beginning. Today, uh, we believe that we have proven that we have a continuous production of LNG, and therefore, uh, we can actually bring this security to the, to the buyers. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, Excellency Minister Obian Lima, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Excellent. Con continuing on, you've, you've been a huge champion of LNG to Africa. Uh, advocating strongly for African countries to trade gas between one another. Uh, when we're discussing the global context of a competitive gas market, can, what can, how can gas countries accelerate that discussion? We're talking gas infrastructure, we're talking finance, we're talking access to markets. How do you bridge all of those divides and ensure that we realize those dreams? Okay, the, the biggest obstacle that we have is that uh, it's, it's very sad, but is the true? Nor Equatorial Guinea, nor Angola, nor Algeria, <coughs> nor any Africa producer, LNG producer, can actually send LNG to an African country. So if our brothers and sisters in Ghana want that LNG, we can send it. And the main reason is because they don't have infrastructure. Now, they have infrastructure to receive diesel, gasoline, any other thing, but no LNG. So the infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure is the biggest problem. So it's not just to look for the market, you need to be able to build or support <coughs> that infrastructure that is not very complicated. And this has, has been the example of Equatorial Guinea. We have built right now, we are building a regasification, small scale regasification plant in the continental part in Nako, because we want to prove that if we can do it, send LNG, from Bioko Island to the continental part, then we can send LNG to Ghana, to Togo, to anywhere. But also I have to remember that the, 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 the fuel, in this case the LNG, it's the same thing that you're sending diesel. So you already have all this channel in which, I'll give you an example. You have Ghana, in which Ghana receives uh, diesel and gasoline, Then it's not only for Ghana. They send all by trucks all the way to Burkina Faso. So the same thing of transportation that you can do diesel, you can do it with LNG. But the big difference is that LNG is 50% cheaper than diesel. And that with LNG, you can use it for generators, you can use it for air conditioning, and you, can, you can use it with petrochemicals. So our biggest challenge is that in Africa, we don't have infrastructure. Right now, the two biggest African consumers that are looking at very seriously, it's South Africa and Morocco. And both of them, their biggest challenge is to have infrastructure because the infrastructure of LNG is much different than the regular infrastructure that you will have bringing crude or the refined. But clearly the use that we can have, especially because it's a cleaner fuel, it's a better fuel and more environmentally, we need to be able to help many African countries who can have those terminals because those terminals are very simple. Once you have the terminal, you have the, the in this case, the, 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 the tanks to have the LNG, you have the equipment to regasify, and then from there you can have a pipeline. Because a lot of African countries believe that I have gas, then I don't need LNG. The, if you have a gas discovery, you still need to build the pipelines, you need to put the platforms, and it's a lot of capital you do. But if you bring LNG, it's like bringing diesel. So rather than us being using car, cars, that use, in this case, diesel or gasoline. You should be using gas, uh, cars that use LNG. At this moment, you have trucks that work, work with LNG, and now many of the ships worldwide are going to be changing to LNG. So definitely the biggest problem is infrastructure, and, and, and we encourage more African countries to think about building receiving terminals 
for LNG, not for small scale, but also for big scales. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, Mr. Chihi, I, I wanted to bring this issue to, to you because uh, Algeria being a pioneer in the LNG market had to consider both sides of the coin. One, being able to produce that LNG at scale, but also being able to bring it to markets that would be able to have the receiving terminal. How, how do you, is there an, uh, an example, a lesson to be learned from Algeria's experience that we can bring to the rest of the continent to address those infrastructure shortage concerns and also to provide a financing solution to that? Thank you. Uh, as you may know, those, uh, this kind of infrastructures are very capital intensive. This is uh, uh, something that can be done in the past, but uh, recent years uh, with the increase of the cost, etc., etc. So uh, those are uh, very, very, uh, very expensive. And uh, Sonatrac uh, built its own, let's say, its own infrastructure from uh, its uh, sec securing its uh, financial sources, but now such kind of uh, uh, project maybe require other kind of uh, financing, uh, re requiring maybe some integrators as well also between uh, uh, local companies and uh, other financing in order to uh, be able to promote such kind of uh, investments. Uh, having both uh, LNG facilities and gas pipelines it's the must, you know. It's uh, something that could give you the flexibility to regulate according to the, con to the, to the market and the requirements of the clients. This is, this is uh, something which is very, very important and hopefully my country was able to, uh, to, to follow this particular way. Now, uh, this is a strength, definitely. This is a strength for people, for, sorry, for countries and the companies uh, exhibiting such uh, infrastructure. Now we have, we are, do, we are do, let's say, we are uh, monetizing our production <coughs> accordingly to uh, the requirements of the market and while using uh, the appropriate way in order to uh, send those molecules of gas, natural gas, could be through gas pipelines, it could be through uh, uh, LNG for, uh, within LNG form, and uh, targeting very specific uh, markets. So, for people uh, marketing natural gas, uh, the situation is is not as easy as it was in the past. Now, definitely, we are entering a new phase, and we have to cope with the new market conditions. This is what is is done now. Uh, LNG. Is, is a plus. Energy is uh, give you the, the ability to uh, expand your uh, area of influence and uh, you, being uh, able to touch very, uh, very far uh, clients. But also, uh, gas pipelines is something we are really uh, appreciating because this kind of uh, infrastructure uh, secure the energy for the different clients in the, uh, for the particular case of Algeria for the southern part of Europe and this is fundamental. Now what could be done? Uh, maybe we can uh, imagine kind of synergies uh, bringing two companies, two countries to neighboring countries in order to uh, set up this kind of industry, I mean uh, LNG industry in the uh, area where uh, uh, deposits ha have already been uh, discovered. And uh, uh, let's say that could be benefit for the benefit of both two or th more two uh, parties. This is very important. And from uh, the mapping of the recent discoveries, I think uh, synergies could be uh, considered in different parts of, uh, of the world, especially within the African uh, countries. Yeah. Uh, Excellency uh, Obiang Lima, the, Equatorial Guinea has a lot of experience in this, having you know, pioneered a lot of cooperation amongst countries in, in, in the Gulf of Guinea. Can you kind of explain to the audience some of the developments that are happening here and how uh, you've positioned Equatorial Guinea, 
in cooperation with neighboring countries like Ghana and Cameroon uh, and Sao Tome uh, to develop this idea of a gas mega hub where the Gulf of Guinea becomes an international hub for, uh, for gas exports? Well, first of all, I want to remind you that Equatorial Guinea is it's a small country. We are the smallest producer of this organization. But sometimes when you are small, you become more agile. You get to learn from the experience of the big ones, and this is the big producer. But also you think about the future. We have only one LNG train. So we are thinking what we can do. We can either gather all the gas to do train two, or we either can bring the gas and then do some refilling of the coolant train that we have, and then look for other sectors. Because at this moment, LNG is the resource that gives you more commercial value. But with gas, you have electricity. With gas, you can have urea. With gas, you can create jobs. So clearly, it's, each country has their different qualities. I cannot say that we are pioneers. Nigeria use a lot of the gas. They already are using through power. They are using for petrochemics. We have Angola who is doing the same thing. Our key particularity is our geographical location. We are in the middle of the Gulf of Guinea. So, and, and this was funny because when we didn't have oil, at night, if you go to what we see all the lights now, you could see all the fires in Nigeria, all the lights in Nigeria. You see the lights in Cameroon. You see the lights sometimes to Gabon if you were actually in Congo. And it was not the electricity, it was flaring. So for us, we believe that we are in the best geographical location that we can be able to utilize a lot of the resources, but not only for the neighbors, our own resources. Because you have to remember one thing in Gulf of Guinea. The oil operators in the Gulf of Guinea are looking for oil, not for gas. So whenever they do geology and they find gas, they distract that, uh, that, um, that resource. They look for the oil. And a lot of the discovery of gas that we have has been made by mistakes. So we do believe that the Gulf of Guinea is actually more gas prone than oil prone. I mean, I was last week in Nigeria and I was with President Buhari and he was telling me, Excellency Gabriel, we were supposed to be producing more gas than oil. The problem is that we had a plan, we didn't continue. So we all know that we have more gas in the Gulf of Guinea than oil. And probably the Gulf of Guinea could be a, a big challenge to Qatar and to Russia if we all get together and utilize all that gas. Uh, Dr. Syed, um, His Excellency the Minister brought up a, a great point, uh, an often forgotten point about what we're talking about, and that's uh, gas as a contributor to job growth. Uh, we've been talking about LNG and pipeline. We've been talking about gas as an export resource, but we haven't talked about gas for domestic purposes and for industry, for petrochemicals. Uh, is this too often neglected as a strategic element of, of the gas industry? And how much more should we focus on gas for industrial purposes, for downstream, for petrochemicals? Well, uh, this is a very important, uh, actually, point because uh, uh, in general, when oil and gas uh, were discovered in many countries, they thought that this is uh, just uh, uh, for uh, a sale uh, in a form of crude or uh, uh, without any processing. But uh, later on, uh, many countries have come to realize that uh, processing uh, uh, gas, especially gas, uh, would uh, lead to uh, lots of uh, uh, growth in the industry and in job creation. And uh, they have gradually <clears throat> realized that uh, uh, the best way <clears throat> is uh, to really divide <clears throat> some part of the gas could be exported and be a player in the global gas market at the same time uh, to uh, inject it and fuel economic development inside the country. And uh, not only petrochemical, but also, I mean, uh, in the power generation, in the power generation, uh, which is uh, very much uh, lacking in many African countries, gas can play a big role. Uh, um, I understand that, for example, there are some <clears throat> advocates for renewables for uh, increasing the 
uh, power generation in some uh, less developed uh, African countries. Whereas um, I believe that gas <coughs> is a better solution, is an easier solution, is a more accessible solution, <coughs> is more affo affordable solution. Mm -hmm. uh, even <coughs> gas, uh, as uh, His Excellency the Minister said, can be transported into uh, uh, remote areas. Uh, so we have to stop <coughs> thinking that gas is only good for heating and cooking. Gas is good for industry. Gas is good for petrochemicals. And we see that uh, some of uh, the countries who have uh, used gas for their petrochemical uh, sector, <coughs> they have been able to even generate more revenues through exporting petrochemical products outside than just exporting gas. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, one would say that uh, even gas is good to be imported and to be processed and develop the petrochemical industry in some of the uh, importing countries. Uh, and uh, I guess that uh, especially when we talk about uh, uh, poverty alleviation in some parts of Africa, I think gas could be one of the solutions. Solutions uh, in terms of whether production and exporting, or even importation of gas, getting it processed, and uh, uh, producing some products, and exporting it, or even to... Uh, so poverty alleviation and energy poverty, both are something that could be really uh, addressed by uh, gas as a source of economic development and the source of the energy uh, generation. Thank you very much, Dr. Syed. We, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask one last question that's going to uh, be addressed to each of the panelists. Uh, I want to start with uh, His Excellency, the Secretary of State of Angola. Uh, in the last five years ago, there were a lot of differences in the gas market compared to today. Uh, a big one was the United States was not exporting gas, and I think that's probably a big, big surprise uh, that's changed a lot um, perspective on the industry. Uh, in the next five years, what do you think is going to be the biggest change that we see in the gas industry, the biggest opportunity, and the biggest threat? Okay, thank you, Duane. Well, it's a, it's a reality that um, the United States and other countries actually start uh, also exporting gas instead of just buying. But uh, in Angola, we do believe there's still a market. Uh, we should look among the African countries. Before actually looking outside of the continent, we have opportunities within our own continent. For Angola, we believe, and uh, sorry if I go back, we do believe that the gas industry in a whole <coughs> will bring the opportunity for young Angol Angolans to find uh, their first job. Uh, direct jobs relate to the gas industry, <coughs> but also indirectly by uh, powering, uh, providing the, the fuel for uh, petrochemical industries and the others. Uh, we do believe that uh, if we actually uh, look at, uh, discuss with the other countries, even those that do not have the, the financial, financial resources, but uh, all together we, we, we can put together a financing system that will allow us to create these infrastructures in different countries. Uh, from the Angolan region, if we can build a transnational railway system, we can also transport LNG via uh, this, uh, this means and this will alleviate, alleviate the cost of uh, the export of the gas. So for the five years, I would say, concluding that uh, we still have a market, but we should maybe focus on Africa. Thank you, Excellency. Okay. Mr. Chihi. Yes, uh, monetizing of gas is one of um, our most important issues uh, where uh, we're facing in Algeria as the other gas producers. Uh, selling gas as just as gas molecules, uh, maybe we can do better. But that's what we are intending and uh, starting. Uh, we are uh, mapping the uh, different gaps that used to exist between the three uh, uh, 
typical markets, I mean gas market, uh, Atlantic market, European market, and South uh, and Asian market. As you probably know, the differences and the gaps are being very reduced, and in maybe few years, uh, there, will, there will, will not be any difference between uh, the prices that should be applied uh, existing within Europe, for the case of Europe, and Asia. So we would like to monetize our gas. What we are uh, doing right now in Algeria uh, for the next coming years is setting up this and developing the petrochemical industry. So uh, within our boundaries, within the country, and also <coughs> considering uh, setting up joint ventures with different partners uh, in Europe, for example, and sending our gas as a feedstock for those joint ventures for uh, producing those petrochemicals. This is the way that we are uh, uh, considering now, and we uh, signed uh, uh, some contracts with uh, different partners, and we are encouraging the, the, such approach. So we are gi giving more value to our gas, and because if you would like to be uh, competitive on, the, uh, on this market of petrochemicals, we have to consider uh, world scale uh, plants rather than having small, small plants. And this is something that could be done solely if we, the resources are there, or for diversification, for sharing the risk, etc., etc., would prefer to do that with our partners. And that, this is what we are doing uh, currently with some partners. This is the way we are encouraging uh, for the future, for the next coming uh, years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shee. Dr. Syed? Well, I think that in the next five years, the prices of gas uh, uh, will remain to be very competitive as it is now, and the production of gas also will be abundant. Therefore, it is the best opportunity for expansion of the use of gas. This is a golden opportunity because after 2030, I think that that would be much more difficult because renewables would be uh, really competing with, uh, with uh, gas. But the, uh, the threat, you said, is uh, the competition and harmony among the gas producing countries. The competition is going to be uh, very uh, tough uh, from both uh, the newcomers as well as uh, by, uh, by uh, renewables. And uh, there is a a challenge of how to harmonize the uh, strategies and the marketing act, uh, activities on all of these things. Thank you very much, Dr. Syed. And Excellency, we finish with you. Okay, very short. I will say the great opportunity is that, uh, especially for our continent, is that we have a great opportunity to change from using diesel to gas. That's very critical. It's cheaper, it's more cleaner. And this is a great opportunity, like uh, the doctor have said here, there's going to be abundance of gas where you can buy gas from the United States, you can buy from Qatar. So this is a great opportunity because it will be extremely more cheaper. The biggest challenge, infrastructure. If we don't have the infrastructure in the port to receive cargos of LNG, storage for LNG, transport all that gas, that opportunity will go. Everybody in the world is using gas. The Asian are using gas. North America, Latin America is the only continent who is actually not building infrastructure and using gas is our African continent. And by the time we realize, we will be late. So I think this is the best time that Africans should be able to do that transition. Diesel, it pollutes more, it is more expensive, and all the generators today that use diesel can be transferred to use gas, and it will be much cheaper and cleaner. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please get a round of applause for our distinguished panel? <laughs> that concludes our panel, and uh, I welcome our Master of Ceremonies to lead the way. <laughs>